So glad you're all here this year. There's, there's been so many obstacles with the past two years, but it's, I tell you what I'm enjoying seeing in the marketplace is when people stop by and visit at the table, I'm seeing so many young people with their parents who aren't just tagging along, right? If, if you're like me, sometimes you wonder like, where's the next generation? Which they might be wondering, when are you gonna get out of the way? But it's, uh, <laughs> it's wonderful to see young people now beginning to share the enthusiasm of their parents. Just like Abraham and Isaac. Isaac had to dig out Abraham's wells, but they were the same wells, right? And so Abraham's experience, it was different from Isaac's, but the, the cool thing about Isaac is once he dug them out, he named them. He called them, he gave them a purpose. And so I think some of the wells that, that we've dug as a generation, now the younger folks are coming along and they're giving more purpose to what we have done. For them, it's taking on more definition. We were the machete people, um, hacking up weeds, moving rocks around that probably didn't need to be moved most of the time. But we did make the way a little bit clearer. And so just keep going, young folks, keep going. So what I'd like to, to do today is, first of all, check the time. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's like, and I can actually see it if there's not people in front of me. So uh, <laughs> y'all just stay right there. I can't see the other number. Uh, I'd like to do something that is not really normal for me. If you know anything about where we've been over the past 20 something years, you know it's heavy into the Torah portions. If I'm anything, I'm a Torah portion person. And I will do anything to get you into the Torah portions because we understand that you're not gonna understand anything after the Torah portions if you don't understand what's in the Torah portions. Revelation is just way, way, way over your head if you don't understand that it is kind of, um, you know, like the Yahtzee can where they shake stuff up and then they throw it out. Well, that's what Revelation is. It's Torah portions shaken up and thrown out on a table that you get to reassemble. And that can be a challenge, again, if you're, you're chasing after the tinfoil hat stuff and you're consuming that energy that needs to go into the Torah portions because if you want to understand prophecy, the Torah is the prophecy and the prophets are its legs. And that's kind of been the amazement over the past couple of years. Uh, I want to do something different for the Shemitah year. And rather than going through the Torah portions with fresh material like we always had in our, in our weekly classes, I said, rather than start something fresh and new, why don't we just revisit the material that we've had over the Torah portions and match it up with the Song of Songs? And I didn't have any idea when we started that we would get to lesson 116 and just be on chapter three, verse one. And that's what it dawned on me, how prophetic the work of the Song of Songs is. It's full of end time prophecy. It's full of resurrection. And so I'd like to take a lesson from that um, called How Far Gone Is the Night? Because especially in chapter three, as we're getting into the Song of Songs, it's describing to us the wilderness journey. And I think we can agree at this point, it's established that we are in the wilderness of the peoples. There is a geographical wilderness between Egypt and the promised land, but after Israel is scattered, there is another wilderness referred to in scripture as the wilderness of the peoples. And Eddie, it was great what he did today because it prepares us to hear about our wilderness experience and how we should be behaving as we are being staged in our particular wilderness. That's going to be so wonderful, so much more wonderful than just an exodus from Egypt that we will have this memory of the wilderness of the peoples. So where we are right now, remember this. Remember what it was like. So with those, those Passover seders, you can tell the young folks, this is what it was like when we were out there. And he brought us out of all those nations and he staged us in a wilderness of the peoples. So how far gone is the night is the question. Because if, if you kind of know prophetic hints, 
symbolism and so forth. And I'm going to give you a, a few tools if you want to write them down. Uh, I'm not a prophecy teacher. I'll never tell you I'm a prophecy teacher. I am a Torah teacher, and prophecy tends to grow out of that. Uh, but it, again, how far gone is the night? How many of you think the night is almost over? I think we're pretty close. I think we're real close. So we want to look at some basic principles this afternoon. How can we know the exile is almost over? Uh, that was another term that Eddie introduced that was so important to understanding the wilderness. Because if you're out there in the wilderness of the people, you're in the night. Because night equals exile. Night equals exile. So you have to look at it in context. But often when you're reading about light and darkness, day and night, and so forth, what you're reading, even going back as far as, as Genesis 1, does it talk about the separation of the light and the darkness? Well, he recognized even back before humankind was created that we would be in exile. And he separated the light from the darkness in order to teach us in a seed prophecy what we should expect in terms of coming out of the darkness of the night, coming out of the darkness of the exile. So we just want to look at some basic principles this afternoon that will bring in the image of the beast, how we're going to look at that, and this wilderness gathering of Israel. Because Song of Songs, it's unbelievably accurate for this time period. I don't know if you realize that. It is spot on in terms of our recent history. It's accurate. So in chapter 3 of the Song of Songs, we're going to look at a particular, uh, we'd say a working scripture. right? And if you want to go ahead and look it up, it's going to just start with Song of Songs 3.1. But the, the idea here that, that we're going to be looking at is if we are seeking Adonai, and maybe we already have a relationship with him, but yet how many of us said there has to be something more than this? And so we started seeking, and we found something more than whatever it was that we had. So you must seek him, and you must find him alone, just you. But yet, when you find him, you must embrace him with a congregation. Yes. See how we're going from me to we? <laughs> and so here's the pattern. I'm going to show you just directly from Song of Songs 3.1. It says, on my bed, and I'm going to unpack this uh, in some detail. And th so this would be a great place to take notes if you were going to. It says, on my bed, night after night, what does night equal? Exile. On my bed, night after night, I sought him whom my soul loves. Thank you, Rod Woodruff, for the song, Shema Yisrael. I sought him, but I did not find him. I must arise now and go around in the city, in the streets, and in the public squares. I must seek him whom my soul loves. I sought him but I did not find him. The watchmen who make the rounds in the city found me, and I said, have you seen him whom my soul loves? Hardly had I left them when I found him whom my soul loves. I held on to him, and I would not let him go until I had brought him to my mother's house and into the room of her who conceived me. All right, very poetic language, right? It sounds like an unrequited love story, and finally, in the end, we find the beloved. But that's just the surface. You can never read Song of Songs at only a literal level because it's so heavy with prophetic symbolism. So let's just go back to the beginning. On my bed. When you're on your bed, depends on the context, sometimes what it means is that you are sick, that your soul is sick. It's not in good shape. And so the rabbis say this refers to a sick bed. Did Yeshua raise people up off of their sick beds? He did. Something was wrong. 
And so it says, on my bed, night after night. Now, sometimes when you see bed, it, it's going to symbolize a sleep of death. Not just sleep, but a sleep of death. So she knows, she has some sort of relationship with the one whom her soul loves. It's, like she's not, it's not like she never heard of him. She knows exactly who he is, so much so that she's seeking him night after night. The problem is she's on her bed. Now, if you're looking for someone, what are the odds you're going to find them on your bed? Well, well <laughs> didn't mean that. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> Let's go back. <laughs> if you're looking for someone, we hope that you don't find them on your bed. <laughs> We want you to get up off of your bed and go seek the one with whom you have this relationship, but yet it's suggesting that there is an estrangement that has occurred. She knows who he is, but he's estranged. And she's seeking night after night. So she's in a state of soul sickness. There's a, a, a problem. There's a defect in her relationship with the Holy One. And so if night represents exile, she is seeking him exile after exile. Now there's two main exiles that we're concerned with. We're not concerned with the Egyptian exile at this point. We're concerned with the image of the beast because remember with the image of the beast we have basically four kingdoms. We have the golden head, of course, of Babylon. We have this silver... Um, upper torso of Medo-Persia, the bear. We have the bronze belly of Greece, and then we have the iron legs of Rome, and then down in the feet we have the mixture of the clay and the iron of Rome. And what we have to understand, it's one image, it's one person. Nebuchadnezzar saw one image of a person, one image of a man. It's the image of a beast. Later, Daniel describes it as separate animals, but it's one image of a human being. And so, whatever started with the head in Babylon, it simply continued down through those four beast, four beast kingdoms until they ended up in our feet. And now those feet stand up on the world and those systems, whether they're political, governmental, military, medicine, literature, philosophy, sports, drama, all those systems were simply perfected by Rome and then sent out into the world to infect the nations of the world with those particular systems. So that's the image of the beast we're concerned with. And so the beast, Babylon, took Israel into exile, primarily the, the southern kingdom of Judah, took them into exile. Now that night, or that exile, had an end to it. The Jews were allowed to go back, they were allowed to rebuild their temple, and then eventually we have uh, the Medo-Persians are going to be conquered by the Greeks. And that's where you have a big problem, not with exile, with the Greek Beast kingdom, what you have a problem with is the, the leopard spots of Greece. It says, can a leopard change its spots? No, it can't, because those spots are the systems. You can do a Hebrew study, and what you find out is the spots on the leopard are the systems that aren't changing from kingdom to kingdom. And so they simply do what? They introduce the, the sports, the philosophy, the literature, all these systems into the Jewish society, and then you end up with Hellenistic Jews. And then we have the story of the Maccabees, of Hanukkah, and, and these sorts of things. So the infestation of Greece was from within. There was no exile there. But then we have Rome come along, and there is a second exile. There is a final exile of Rome from which there has not been a full return. We know the Jews have become... Uh, have had the ability to begin to go back from that second night, that second exile. So night after night, the Babylonian exile and then the Roman exile, which we're still in. If we're not sitting right now in Jerusalem, having this conversation is a good possibility that we are still in the night. But 
if Judah has been able to go back to the land and to begin to open the land up for the feasts and so forth, to reinstate some of the, the commandments of the Torah, then we can say, well, there's a dawn getting ready to break. We can see a little light there on the horizon. It's in these two exiles that she's seeking him whom her soul loves. She loves him. She might be soul sick, but she loves him. And so at some point she realizes, I can't stay on my sick bed and find him. I know who he is, but I can't get my arms around him this way. And that's kind of the way we felt before we encountered, if we maybe had a relationship with Yeshua, but we hadn't really encountered the Torah, it felt like, I knew, I know Yeshua, I just don't feel like I'm getting my arms around him. And so at some point, she's going to realize she has to get up off of that sick bed and go look for him because he's not where she is. So in this second exile, two here, I'm going to give you another prophecy tip. When you see something doubled, it might indicate you're looking at two separate time periods. So when it says night after night, exile after exile, you can pretty much say, this exile, Babylon, this exile, Rome. So her, her soul loves him. Who does our soul love? Yeshua. Shema Yisrael. Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. You shall love him with all your heart and your soul and your strength. So she, she has this essence of the Shema. She loves him with all her soul, but she's still in a state of sickness. In order to find him whom her soul loves, in order to fulfill the Shema in her life, she's got to get up. And she says, I must arise. Now, when someone arises again, it's, it's the idea that they're ascending a level spiritually. In this case, clearly she is. She's getting up off of a sick bed. She says, I have to arise. But it's also a hint toward the resurrection. There's going to have to be a resurrection in order for her to be able to embrace the one whom her soul loves. So she says, let me take a step here. I'm going to go around. That's a key. She says, I have to go around the city. Right, remember the, the watchtowers around Jerusalem. This is taking you back to Genesis, the Garden of Eden. It says that the rivers survive. They went around and around Eden. And so as she's circling the city, the implication here is we're talking about Jerusalem. We're talking about the holy city. And she says, I must arise and I need to go around and around if I'm going to find him. How do our feasts move? In a circle. They're the chagim, they're the circling feasts. She looks in the streets, in the public squares, which remember in Proverbs it says, this is where wisdom goes, out into the streets in the public squares. She's finding this information because we know what's out there. But who else is out there? <laughs> the harlot's out there too. <laughs> she sits in the same places and she cries out to the same people. So she's going to have to go around and around the city and to be able to distinguish between the voice of the Holy Spirit and the voice of the harlot. I have to seek him if I'm going to find him. She says, I sought him, but I did not find him. Then she encounters someone. She says, the watchmen who make the rounds. So we're getting double rounds here. It's not random space. The watchmen are called hasovevim. Hasovevim. Do you hear savav in hasovevim? It means to circle. What do the watchmen do? They circle the city at night. And here's the thing about a night watchman. They have to have good ears because it's nighttime and they don't have street lights, <laughs> at least not in this time. And so Shema Yisrael doesn't tell you to look, O Israel. Shema Yisrael tells you to hear, listen. 
So if you are in the night of your exile, you first need to tune your ears. Because if you can hear it, then you can see it. So she finds these watchmen, these men who go around and around the city, just as the, the pattern of the rivers of Eden, just as the pattern of the feasts. And these men are going to have their ears tuned to the hours of the night. It is actually it's fun to, to read in the, the Jewish sources how they can tell the passage of time in the night, particular signs that Yeshua even mentioned. He knew of these things. But she has to find the night watchmen because these are the ones who are going to be able to tell her when the night is almost over. They're going to be able to tell her when the dawn or the son of the dawn, which is Yeshua, he's the, the son of the dawn, the star of the morning, he is the one. And she says, how much longer can you hear him? And she says, have you seen him whom my soul loves? Most likely, if they have not seen him, they have a pretty good idea where he is. Because hardly had she left them when she found him. So if you want to find Yeshua and you want to embrace him whom your soul loves, you're going to have to get off of your sick bed. You're going to realize he won't come to you in that nastiness. But if you will get up off of your sick bed and go look for him in the places where you know he should be. Scripture told us where he should be. The pattern is there from Genesis 1.1. On day four of creation, the feasts were set in place. And they have been circling ever since because they're based on something that is also going round and round up in the heavenlies. And so once she gets in on his rhythm, once she gets on his calendar, once she gets in on his feasts, she finds him. Now, would you guys agree that you can embrace Yeshua in a much more tangible way today than before you knew how he moved? So you grab him. I found the one whom my soul loves. And she doesn't let go. And this is important. I don't know what to think about people who find the Shabbat. They find the feasts. They find the word and they let go. And they go back to the sick bed. That doesn't make any sense to me. Once you find him, why in the world would you go back to that? But she says, I held on to him. I would not let him go until I had brought him to my mother's house and into the room of her who conceived me. Kind of an odd turn of phrase, isn't it? You're thinking, that's a little weird. <laughs> but now let's, let's think of what we know about Yeshua's conception. What do we know about his conception? That his mother was overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh that the spirit was involved in his conception. And the Jewish understanding, this room, this house that she's taking him to is the Mishkan. It's the temple, it's the tabernacle. It's the place where his presence abides. So she's not taking him back to the sick bed. She's taking him to the holy place. She's prepared now. She's going to be able to embrace him, to not let him go. And the Mishkan here is the key because the Mishkan comes from the wilderness. And so if we are going to seek him whom our soul loves, we had to get up off of our sickbed. And then we had to find him in the place where, you know what? He said, this is where I'll be. You can even find me in the night watches if you will find me in the feasts. You can even find me in the night watches if you will find me on Shabbat. Just go to my word and I've told you exactly where I will be. And the great thing is that there have been watchmen raised up among us. There have been some great watchmen who have walked with us to bring us this place. There was somebody back there that you said, now tell me again about this Shabbat thing you're doing. Or you said, you're having a 
Passover? You mean Easter? And they said, no. What do you mean you're not coming to the company Christmas party? And they explained it to you. So you found a watchman who could shma. And so you realized at some point that you could embrace this one whom your soul loved on his terms and not yours. As long as we're forcing him onto our terms, we're going to stay on that sickbed. We're not looking for him. We're expecting him to come find us and bail us out of the sickbed. But she has the ability to get off of that sickbed. And because of the night watchman, she's able to find him. So don't give up on being a night watchman. If it feels like people aren't listening, you keep telling them where he may be found, where they may embrace him. You be faithful in those night watches. And then the collection here, and see, this is the transition. She's alone on her bed night after night. She had to go seek him and find him alone. But once she found him, she brings him back to the tabernacle. Because the tabernacle, the Mishkan, was to draw Israel together. And that's what I mean. You seek him and you find him alone, but you embrace him and you dwell with him as a congregation. So if you're not prepared to also embrace a congregation, you're going to be doing a lot of night walking. You're going to be doing maybe a lot of sleepwalking. Because the house of her who conceived me, the it's seen as symbolic of the Holy Spirit. And so if the Holy Spirit conceives us like Yeshua, if we're like Yeshua, there is a conception that takes place. And we say, you know what, it's the divine presence that it is talking about. He built, he had them build the Mishkan, he says, so I can dwell among them. No Mishkan, apparently no dwelling among them. It's solo, and apparently solo is not so great. It's sickness. It doesn't mean you don't have a relationship. It means you're going to have trouble embracing him because you're having trouble embracing other people. So twice per day, you can be reminded of this when you say the Shema. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with your soul, with your strength. And you can ask yourself, Am I seeking him whom my soul loves where he told me he could be found? And along with this idea of taking her into the house in the room of her who conceived me, it goes back to not only was the, the Mishkan in the wilderness, as Eddie was saying, it was surrounded by clouds of glory. There was a pillar of cloud, yes, that was one cloud, but... but it's so like he said, we, don't be ignorant of this. We were all under the cloud. That's a different cloud. The pillar is going to guide you. It's a specific thing, but we were all under the cloud. And in the, the Jewish tradition, these are called clouds of glory or Sukkot of glory in the wilderness, that when they entered into Sukkot after they left Egypt, that this is when they entered into the clouds of glory. And this is where the Mishkan was built, within the clouds of glory. So that gives a another layer of understanding of him returning with this great cloud of witnesses that from that wilderness until this wilderness he is assembling his people the problem is again how are we going to worship if we only worship alone are we really in the cloud are we counted in the cloud if we worship alone so you know like everybody's been saying find a place to link arms, find a place to join in, to have an identity. If you say, I'm all alone, up, or I'm literally up here on a mountain somewhere. Yes. Right now, they haven't cut off the internet. As bad as the internet is, there's a positive aspect to it. You, you find a Jacob's tent, you find a river of life, and you let it be as if you were sitting right there in the chair with them. Because they're praying for you that way, by the way. They do pray for you. So just to go back through this, night equals exile. The bed can equal sickness, spiritual laxity, or death. 
Dawn is the end of the exile. Day is going to be a time when Israel is dwelling in his inheritance, able to go up to Jerusalem at the feast and obedient. This is the day. See how in the beginning he separated the night from the day? And so if, again, if you see a doubled mention of it, expect that there will be probably two distinct fulfillments of a prophecy. Right? And all of these you would have to do in context. This isn't like a hard and fast rule. Make sure you know the context before you apply it. Ephesians 5, 6 says, See that no one deceives you with empty words. For because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners. In other words, there would be participants with them. For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of the light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth as you try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Sometimes we beat people up because they don't already know what is pleasing to the Lord. But as long as you are learning, this is what Paul is saying, as long as you are learning what is pleasing to the Lord and making those changes, it's okay. Don't expect the person beside you to know how to do everything that you do. They're learning what is pleasing to the Lord. And this is what the wilderness is. It's a staging area of learning what is pleasing to the Lord. He says, don't participate in the useless deeds of darkness because it keeps you in exile. You want to be in the light? You want to be in the day? You want to be in Jerusalem? Then don't do those deeds. It says, instead, even expose them. So the things that we're doing in the night, we should also be able to do in the daylight. Is that right? We shouldn't be doing anything in the night that we cannot also do in the daylight. Because the daylight merely exposes what already is. It's already there. This is why you've got a menorah in the Mishkan. You've got this, these seven branches of the menorah, and it represents the light of Israel. And they're going to light those lights to shine through the night. And see, that's our job. We have to shine through the night of exile because when the day dawns, it's going to expose what already is. We don't necessarily need the menorah during the day because that represents a time of obedience where, like he says, the lamp is the lamb. It's just this ambient light. But in a night of exile, we have to try a little harder. And if you want to get oil in the lamp, you get smashed repeatedly. <laughs> and that's where you get the oil that goes into the lamp. It says it's disgraceful even to speak of the things which are done of them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, for everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason, it says, awake sleeper and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. This is what she's done in the Song of Songs. She has arisen. She has arisen to the light. And what's going to happen from this staging area, there will be another arising to the light of the resurrection. So again, you seek him and you find him alone, but you need to embrace him within a congregation. You need to begin to serve there so that his presence can dwell among us. If you'll notice the pattern, again, like Eddie was saying, there's way more to the spring feast than maybe we previously thought in terms of the gathering. It seems to represent a progressive gathering beginning at Pesach. And if you'll notice, as they, they prepare the sheaves of Pesach, they don't cut them first. They don't cut the barley first. They go to the living barley. They tie a string around it and make a sheaf. And then only later does he come in and cut the living sheaf. And so far too often, because correctness has been the idol, we have stood apart and said, I am a stock unto myself. I'll stand right here because everybody else is doing it wrong. But that's not the pattern. The pattern is that he will bundle you with other living stocks 
of barley. He will gather you into a flock. He'll go look for one, but he expects the one to come back to the 99. He's not going to take the 99 to the one. So we can't deny that there is a pattern here of gathering for our growth so that our roots will quit going out and start going down. So this is what happens in the, in the exile. Darkness can hide all its secrets. You realize right now you can hide all your secrets from your friends and your neighbors and your fellow congregants. You can go out and, and act like the devil out of their sight. Maybe they won't know if you don't put it on Facebook. But you know when the day dawns, it's all going to be exposed and who you are is who you are at that time. So we want to get bundled here in the night with like kind and like mind. Because the day when it dawns, it's going to expose all these secrets. Yeshua is the light. The Torah is the light. And so this menorah in the wilderness, it's a means for Israel to be a light to the nations. Why is he gathering us together? It intensifies the light, number one, when you put all the lights together. But it lets all these nations out here know that we have embraced the light of the Torah, that we have found the one whom our soul loves, and we're not going to let him go. That we are going to invite his presence to dwell among us because he is the one who walks in the middle of the lampstand. He's gathering us. So here's some of the wonderful things we get in the wilderness. If you say, am I just marking time right here? What am I doing here? Are we making any progress? Well, look at all these wonderful things that happened in the wilderness before and look around and see if it's not happening now. The Torah is from the wilderness. Would you say that there is a revival of Torah in the earth right now among the people we least expected to revive with it? The Mishkan was from the wilderness. Somehow we are being gathered even now. You may not realize we, we could already be at a stage of gathering. We're just not aware of it. The Israelites didn't seem to be aware of anything. <laughs> we didn't know if they were walking in the cloud or the fog, right? Well, we don't want to be in a fog about it. What if this is our gathering? And what if he is keeping a record of our complaints and our grumblings and, oh, wow. You mean it's already started? I'm already being graded? <laughs> There's already a scorecard. I've been in this wilderness, but I have been a little complainy and whiny. Oh, let's stop. Let's invite his presence. The court, the judges were from the wilderness. The priesthood is from the wilderness. The Levitical divisions are from the wilderness. Doesn't he say, I'm going to take from among you to be Levites and priests? It could be happening right now. He might be designating you right now. He might be bundling you right now. The monarchy is from the wilderness. Not only do we have this idea of a kingdom of priests, but he also sets the mercy seat among them in the Mishkan. And they call these the goodly gifts of the wilderness, the well, the miraculous well, the manna, and the clouds of glory that protected them, that they walked in with this great cloud of witnesses. And so we were talking about this the other day. What if, what if, this manna was such a big deal in the wilderness. What if in this wilderness, I know we get all caught up in prepping and stuff like that. But what if, like Moses, who existed 80 days on the word, and Yeshua, who existed 40 days as the word, what if that principle was reactivated in our wilderness and all of a sudden the way that we ate was to read the word? If you're hungry, you read the word. Need a snack? Read a verse. <laughs> Imagine how full we might feel if we reached a place like that where we really prayed, give us today our daily bread and meant it. Not give me today my daily bread in the full pantry. Give me today my daily bread and, and all this food I've got stockpiled for the tribulation. 
Oh, but I'm going to pass it out to other people. That's, that's why I'm stockpiling. They, they might be hungry too. I'm like, you're not giving that to them. <laughs> you're playing. But what if he says, you know what? I do things like I did them before, but I never do them exactly like I did them before. You know, that's that pattern in scripture. What if he started literally feeding us on his words? What if he took us one step farther in this wilderness of the peoples and said, just read my word and you'll always be full. You won't ever be hungry. Because remember, it says with Shua, it says after he hungered. After he went through this wilderness test, then he got hungry. But 40 days and 40 nights, apparently it was all, hmm, peace, love, and casseroles, right? I don't know which part of the Bible would be a casserole, but must be the Baptist part. That was a joke, wasn't it? <laughs> I can speak Baptist if I have to. Also from the wilderness, the crowns. Now, you say, that's not in the Torah. Where do you see the crowns in the wilderness? It's not even mentioned until you get into the, the letter to the Hebrews, and the, the letter to the Hebrews mentions how when Israel said, we will do and we will hear, that the angels came down and gave them each a crown, one for we will do and one for we will hear. And then when they sinned with the golden calf, they came down and took them away. Uh, but this specifically refers to the encounter at Mount Sinai, the, the accepting of the Torah. And also prophecy is from the wilderness. That, that prophecy concerning that era started with the burning bush and then Moses comes back to that same location. And we get the great prophecy of the Torah there in the wilderness. Like we say that the Torah is the prophecy, the prophets are its legs. All right, so let's, um, let's look here at Isaiah 21.1. Uh, this might be the same thing Eddie covered, if I remember right. Um, it says, the pronouncement concerning the wilderness of the sea. Okay, here's you another term for your, your prophecy glossary. Sea can sometimes represent the nations or the peoples. The sea can represent the nations or the peoples. And this is where the rabbis get the idea of the wilderness of the peoples. So this is going to concern an exile. As windstorms in the Negev come in turns, it comes from the wilderness, from a terrifying land. Okay, it's coming from the wilderness and it's saying these windstorms, if you're down in the Negev, it's like the windstorms take turns. The allusion there is to the beast kingdoms. They take turns. They don't overlap. Once one kingdom ends, even if it's overnight, the next kingdom is instated. And there, he's saying this is what my pronouncement is like. It's going to concern a change of regime. A harsh vision has been shown to me. The treacherous one still deals treacherously. Remember we said it was one image. So if the king of Babylon, and in Isaiah it says his goal was always to lift himself above the throne of God, to sit on the mount of the Moed, to control your feast days, to lift himself above the height of the stars, the descendants of Abraham. That was what he wanted. And nothing has changed since then, even down to the feet. Those systems are still an attempt to do what the king of Babylon, the treacherous one, see, he kept making deals before he finally destroyed Jerusalem. Daniel was in Babylon long before Jerusalem fell as part of a bribe. You send me your, your wise young men and, and I'll hold off for a while. So he's a treacherous one. And Isaiah's telling us he will still deal treacherously. The destroyer still destroys. So we, again, what's going on? Possibly a fulfillment in the past, a treacherous destroyer but also something future, a treacherous destroyer. Go up Elam, which is Persia, lay siege, Medea. I have put an end to all the groaning she has caused. This is history fulfilled. The Medo-Persian Empire did destroy Babylon and set up. But then Isaiah says, for this reason, my loins are full of anguish. Now we're getting more of the, the language of the birth pangs of Messiah. 
pains have seized me like the pains of a woman in labor. I am so bewildered I cannot hear, so terrified I cannot see. My mind reels, horror overwhelms me. The twilight I longed for has been turned into trembling for me. So here's what's happened. There's history past. There was the end of the exile. There was the end of the Babylonian exile. And he's saying, go on up, Elam. Go on up, Medea. Go ahead and destroy Babylon. I'm going to destroy that destroyer. But then Isaiah, you can hear him kind of turn like, oh, that wasn't the end. There's something else. There's something worse. And he's saying, I, I can't even really explain it. I'm so terrified. My mind is reeling. It's horrifying. Because he's saying, this twilight that I longed for, has been turned into trembling. The end of the Babylonian exile was not the end. There would be another exile even more terrifying. There would be a Roman exile. And this exile was going to end with the birth pangs of Messiah. And this is why he says it's been turned into trembling for me. It's so awful I can't describe it. So there's this taking of turns like the winds of the Negev. You have the regime, the, the exile of Babylon that's brought down, and then you're going to have this Roman exile, which we're still under. It still has yet to be brought down. The good news is it's coming down. We can already see the footsteps of Messiah. So the, the arrogance of Babylon, that's troubling because we see Babylon the Great pop up again in the book of Revelation. See, we say, well, we thought it was the red one. We thought it was Rome. We thought this was the end of the Roman exile. That's why you see it's a scarlet beast. There's a red dragon giving authority to a red beast. They work together. But how again is it taking us back to Babylon the Great is fallen, fallen? Well, remember, let's practice this. When you see a repetition of something, it's a good sign that it's being fulfilled how many times? Twice. So Babylon the Great fell, and Babylon the Great is now falling with Rome, her last kingdom. She started up here with the pride of the head. The head usually is going to represent pride, by the way, and that was the golden head of Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar. But this last king of Babylon, Belshazzar, I don't know if you remember the story of the writing on the wall. And what had happened is the rabbis say that this feast took place the day after Passover. And... Apparently, Belshazzar and his advisors knew the prophecy of 70 years of exile under Babylon. And because of a, a misunderstanding, uh, the Jews at some point had nearly lost heart, and Daniel had to call for the scroll of Jeremiah and say, no, you started calculating too soon. You have to come up to this date, to the destruction of Jerusalem. You don't start back here. He corrected their calculations. It's like, oh my goodness, those calculations just don't stop. But there was the end of the 70 years. But it's just like with the golden calf. They say if they'd waited one more day, hours, if they just waited a few more hours for Moses, they would have seen they didn't need to make this golden calf. Well, if Belshazzar had waited only a few more hours, he would have realized that, you know what? You don't get to keep the Jews. Their exile will end because they say it, it occurred a Pesach evening. They're watching and there is no end. There is no movement anywhere. He's just had a great military victory. And, and there's going to be mirroring language over in the book of, of Revelation where it talks about who can wage war with him. This was the mindset of Belshazzar that night. Who can wage war with me? And Daniel points it out to him. He points the pride out to him. He says, it's because you've done this. You really didn't get it. You knew about Nebuchadnezzar and what happened to him when he literally 
began behaving like a beast until he repented. And you have not repented. And this is the writing on the wall. You have been weighed in the balances and you have been found wanting. So tonight, your kingdom is going to end. And they said that very night, uh, two of his trusted captains didn't recognize him in the city. He actually went up to go to the bathroom. And they didn't recognize him coming back in. And they hit him over the head with the lampstand. Now, there's some symbolism for you. And they said he lay for a while. He didn't die immediately. He had a head wound. And he didn't die immediately. Well, the beast is also going to have a head wound. And he's going to, to deceive people into believing that he has been healed of this head wound. When we know Belshazzar is long dead. He was the last king of Babylon. But they say the great sin was he brought out the temple vessels and he passed them around and says, drink your wine out of this. We will never be vanquished in battle. Their God cannot deliver them from our hand. Eat, drink, and be merry. He didn't know tomorrow he died. But they say this was the arrogance. This was the pride of Babylon. And so that pattern we can take and we can place it right down in our generation. We're living among the systems of Rome today, the red one, the beast. What these systems, and they're not all bad. You have to discern what's going on in each system. But at the point that it tells you your God can't deliver you, you have to turn to us. At the point it tells you that we cannot be defeated. We have supreme power. That's the point when you need to be suspicious. Because their kingdom is going to end faster than they think. But they're trying to take the holy vessels and say, you will always be in my hand. You will never escape my hand. Yeshua said just the opposite. He said, he will never snatch you out of my hand. Never. And if you are in Yeshua's hand, if you have found the one whom your soul loves, the beast can never snatch you out of Yeshua's hand. It doesn't matter where the beast systems are. It's still using philosophy. It's still using medicine. It's still using sports, literature, education, religion, military, politics, government, the arts, music. Those are the leopard spots that Rome inherited and perfected. So every evil thing that is being delivered to you is likely being delivered to you through those systems. How many of you would agree that television has brought complete decadence? It's anything goes. All those systems. How about sports? How many people know the score from last night, but they don't know the poor torsion this week. Tor poor torsion. <laughs> tor portion. <laughs> that was a distortion of the Torah portion. <laughs> How many of our kids know the literature that they're forced to study in school, but they don't know that Jesus didn't walk by Noah's Ark? We have to watch these systems. We have to make sure that the leopard spots that do not change are not sucking us into them and causing us to lean upon them, put trust in them, spend too much money on them rather than on the things of the kingdom. The leopard does not change its spots. And so it's going to happen very fast. If you'll notice the pattern of the beast kingdoms, it's like taking a cup of water, and if you stack them up, it looks like one cup, kind of, just one stack. That's the image of the beast. But in the past, as the kingdoms have changed, it's basically you take the liquid from this cup and you pour it into the next one, and it happens that fast. And that's why Babylon the Great is still present in the book of Revelation. It's simply the end of Babylon that is still contained in Rome. So again, we've got this final beast kingdom that is holding us in a night of exile, or so it thinks. 
Let's go to Isaiah 21, 11. Let's continue the context and we're going to practice some more. Remember, Edom is Esau. Edom is the red one. Seir is the red one, the beast. When you're reading about the beast in Revelation, it's not a new one. It's the same one you read about in the Torah. So look at the repetitions in this passage. The pronouncement concerning Edom. One keeps calling to me from Seir. Same thing. But if you see it doubled, it's likely talking about two different time periods. So there was a time when Edom was going to be conquered, and there was a time when Edom or Seir will be conquered. And the axis of it, watchmen, how far gone is the night? Watchmen, how far gone is the night? There's two times we needed to ask that question. We needed to ask that question during the Babylonian exile. Apparently, Belshazzar didn't know. But the watchmen know, because the watchmen know the scriptures, and the watchmen know the appointed times. And so we are to the second question. Watchmen, how far gone is the night? How far gone is it? Well, here's what the watchman says. Morning comes, but also night and that first fulfillment, he's saying there will be a morning, there will be an end to the Babylonian exile, but then a night will follow, an exile will follow. This is the exile in which we are. And he says, if you would inquire, 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 inquire. Ask about Babylon, ask about Rome. And then he says, come back again. So that repetition, it's a great way for us to keep tabs on how far, the gone, how far gone the night actually is. While we wait for the end of the night, even right now, we know that Revelation, like Eddie was teaching earlier today, we're going to be brought into a wilderness. I think we're there. I don't know what stage of that we're in, but I know we're being staged. But he sees not just righteous Israel, but in Revelation, he sees a woman sitting on a scarlet beast. She's been duped into those systems. She's been duped into Edom, the red one. She's been duped into placing her faith and her trust in those systems instead of the one who will deliver her if she will get off her bed, <laughs> seek him in the night, before the dawn, that's the key. You need to find him before the dawn. Because once the dawn comes up, you got, that's why uh, Mark was saying last night, quit playing around the edges. You'll miss what's going on because your ears aren't tuned. You get in the middle because those people know when the sun's coming up. They know because they shma, they hear. They keep the feast, they keep the Shabbat, they keep the Torah. These are not the people who are going to be deceived by signs and wonders. That's all, he's always been able to duplicate those. But that's not our problem. If we'll stay in the middle here, if we'll stay in the Mishkan, if we will embrace him in the room of the one who conceived us, And so we'll finish here. I think we're out of time. Revelation 13, 1 through 6. And this will just wrap it up really well, I think. It says, the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. And the good news there, prophetically, if you see the beast or the dragon coming up out of the water, he's about to lose his strength. It sounds horrible, but this is actually good news at least from the Jewish way of understanding scripture. When the dragon stands on the sand of the seashore, sea I don't want to mispronounce that one. Uh, <laughs> it looks fierce, but it's just like a, a fish coming out of water. It'll flop around a while, but it'll lose strength pretty fast. And then I saw a beast coming out of the sea. Also good news, the beast loses his strength if he comes out of the sea. When he comes out of the forest or he comes out of a wilderness, we're in trouble. When it's sea-based, we're, we're 
better. It's coming to an end. He has ten horns, seven heads on his head. On his horns are ten crowns. On his heads were blasphemous names. The beast that I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like those of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. I saw one of his heads as if it had been fatally wounded. There's our Belshazzar hint. And his fatal wound was healed. And the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. They worshipped the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast saying, who is like the beast and who is able to wage war with him? That's the Belshazzar. A mouth was given to him speaking arrogant words and blasphemies and authority to act for 42 months was given to him. Now what I'm not real clear on is who gave him that authority. Did that authority come from heaven or did it come from the dragon? It's not, I don't think the antecedent is clear there. But because he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle, that is those who dwell in heaven. I tend to think that authority came from the, the dragon because the dragon would be the one who would speak blasphemies. I don't think the blasphemies would come, that authority would come from heaven. Maybe a permissiveness to allow it to happen for a season. But it sounds like the blasphemies are coming directly from the dragon. So here's the good news, and here's where we'll wrap it up. It says they blasphemed not only God, they blasphemed his tabernacle. Remember the Mishkan, the tabernacle is from the wilderness. So when you are in the wilderness, you will be blasphemed. Just expect that. But the good news is it says those who dwell in heaven. Now that Greek word there is skene, but the Hebrew cognate to that word for tabernacle is ohel. Remember the ohel moed, the tent of meeting in the wilderness, another nickname for the tabernacle, the mishkan, and the sukkah, sukkot of glory. Don't be surprised if you look around at some point and you realize you're already in a realm of heaven. You may not have realized when it happened, probably happened maybe around Pesach, during the days of unleavened bread, Shavuot, the Feast of Trumpets. There's a progression of things that will happen. But it's important that we dwell in his Mishkan in the wilderness. And this is why I think the point is, and the emphasis now is, find your sheaf, find your flock, because they're alive. That sheaf is still alive, even as the, the cord's going around it. You find living people, not people on their sick beds. Don't bind yourself into a sick bed. Get up, go find the feasts. You'll find Yeshua and be able to embrace him in a way that you never have before. And then you take him back there into the Mishkan in the wilderness, and you never ever let him go, and I guarantee you he will never let you go, no matter what happens in that wilderness.